Welcome to another episode of Do Business, Do Life. Jason Kalipa, welcome to the show, my man. Yeah, thanks. It's good to be here, especially coming off the momentum that we had in Tahoe. It's nice to catch up again. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Um, I'll, I'll kind of rewind. So those that missed the first episode I did with Jason, so on my prior show, The Elite Advisor Blueprint, uh, we originally connected out at Mastermind Talks, Jason Gaynard. I remember you ran us through a little private CrossFit workout. And we just kind of stayed in touch, did the podcast episode. But as we were getting ready for Tahoe, um, as you know, Jason, we don't do events at Triad. We do experiences. And one of the things as we were thinking through how do we level up, do business, do life, really a founder's retreat, we had more kids there than we did adults. I was like, I really want like some sort of morning workout session where we can get every, you know, get the juices flowing, get the kids out there. And I reached out to you and like just within like, I think 10 minutes of kind of sharing the high level, you're like, I'm in, let's go. Yeah, I'll bring my family good. too. Good. Yeah. So thank you for being a part of that. You really did help turn that into a true experience. And I know we did a couple uh, sessions, one with the full family and then one that you kind of put us through the ringer a little bit at the, the top, this Kansas guy's not ready for Tahoe elevation. Yeah, that, that, so that elevation. was extra fun. Yeah, there you go. It makes a little bit of a difference for sure. Yeah. Well, so for those that aren't familiar with you, um, former CrossFit Games champion in 2008, on the podium three times, Team USA, which is kind of like the Olympics of CrossFit, the U.S. versus the world, uh, yeah. three-time member there. Um, let's just dive in there because I think you do a lot. You're also an incredible business owner. You're an author. I know being a, a husband and dad is extremely important to you, but let's start with maybe where most people might know you best from, which is CrossFit. And I would just love to hear like, how did that journey begin? Because at one point, you and a couple others were kind of the face of CrossFit when it was just getting on the national scene on ESPN and the CrossFit Games and all of that. Yeah, I mean, so I was introduced to CrossFit in 2006. So at the time, I was working at a conventional gym. I was selling gym memberships. And a buddy of mine introduced me to this online program. And we would just follow the dot-com workout. And I really fell in love with the idea of a coach, a community, and more importantly, the complexity, right? Doing different types of movements. It exposed me to skill sets that I didn't have before. It, it um, got me uncomfortable. And those were the things that I was seeking in my life at the time. And so as I was getting ready to graduate from college, because I was working at the gym full time while I was there, I was like, oh man, I'm going to open up a gym. And so long story short, I ended up opening up a gym, winning the CrossFit Games, and really dedicating myself to CrossFit for the next, you know, decade plus of my life. I traveled the world mm -hmm. everywhere. I taught, I competed, I opened gyms and it was a, it was a great ride. And I learned a lot about fitness. I learned a lot about people and, and, uh, that's really helped me over the last, you know, two decades of, of my career. What do you remember what year when the original like crossfit.com when that got on your radar i'm just curious at what stage did you start to actually winning in 08 how that journey looked it, it was pretty it was pretty short after so you know a lot of things you know in in life and i'm sure people who listen to this like you know um there's that show um how we built this and they always mm -hmm. ask like oh was it luck or was it hard work or whatever mm -hmm. and obviously i think it's a blend of both right because i was introduced to it and i live in the bay area california and the original CrossFit Games location was in the Bay Area at a ranch in Aromas, California. So, you know, I was introduced to it in 06, 07, 08, comes around, kind of been doing it for like a year, pretty seriously. And someone's like, hey, we should go do this. And at the time, it wasn't like I had to pay for a plane ticket or whatever. I just like showed up and rocked and rolled. And, and that really changed my life. And there was definitely luck involved with that. Because if I didn't live where I lived, if it wasn't where it was, I wouldn't have gotten started in it. So that was... That, that was kind of how it started. So, yeah, I did it for about a year before I competed for the first time. Mm. So you let's put it this way, then you were not the the standard guy at the gym just doing uh, chest and arms. You you had probably some base level of full body fitness then if you were able to jump in that quickly and be successful. Yeah, my background was really interesting because in, in high school, um, I didn't apply myself as much as I wanted, but I was pretty big because of football. I was like two six, mm -hmm. which. Right now, I weigh two. You know, like I, I competed at two twelve, and I weigh two twelve right now. Um, like I, that's kind of where I sit is is two twelve. And when I was in high school, I was pretty big because I was playing lineman, and so I was two sixty. And when I realized I wasn't going to end up playing football in college, I found Muay Thai, and I got really interested in Muay Thai. And and 
Muay Thai, for those who are not familiar, is is, is Thai kickboxing, but there's not much weightlifting involved. And so I kind of shrunk. I, I I leaned out. And so now you have this, this baseline strength from building 260, walking around and, and playing football. And then you have this um, kind of leaned out Muay Thai. And that's what kind of flipped me into more full body type stuff with CrossFit. So for those unfamiliar with CrossFit, one, I played football as well in college. So I was kind of, I mean, the thing with football is you bulk up because you got to have some weight, you know, for the pop behind it. <laughs> um, and I remember, I mean, I was the guy that would just go in and try to push heavy weight, squat, bench, cleans, all that. And then I remember seeing the very first CrossFit workout. I think it was YouTube or something. I saw Fran. And I, I think there's almost this sickness with people that do CrossFit. It's like, it's, it's almost like, wow, that looks really, well, at first it looks easy and then you try it and it's insanely hard. Yeah. And then there's almost like this weird sadistic addiction sort of thing that kind of starts to happen. And the, the community of like shared suffering together and it kind of brings people together and forms this really cool community. But was that part of it for you? Because you're, you were already sounds like going out and seeking out things to get uncomfortable and push you. Um, was that kind of the, what pulled you in or what was it that sucked yeah. you into that? Yeah. Into that? I think it was, you know, obviously it, it had a lot to do with like the people I surrounded myself with at the time, they wanted to be hard chargers. Like I was at a point in my life where I wanted to level up. I wanted to be better than who I was. I, I wasn't happy with what I was doing at the time in terms of like reaching my potential. And I utilized the gym as a tool to push myself mentally and physically, which then transferred into other areas of my life. You know, at the time when I graduated from high school, I just wasn't taking life as seriously. And I went to a junior college because I didn't get into the college that I was supposed to, or I wanted to. And, you know, when I was there, I just really woke up like, hey, man, like no one's going to save me. No one's going to do anything for me. If I want to be successful, I need to put in the hard work. And that translated really well into CrossFit because it's the exact same thing. Like, and fitness in general, like people who are listening probably have developed a lot of financial hedges in their life. They, they, they're financially doing well. But when you look at it in terms of different areas of your life, like fitness cannot be bought. You're either putting in the work and, and improving or you're not. And I really fell in love with that idea with CrossFit that like either my times were going to get better and I was going to put in the work or I wasn't. And that translated directly into, Hey, am I going to put in the extra hours to get the commissions on my checks to put money in the bank to build up the financial hedge just like I'm building this fitness hedge. Yeah. And so for those unfamiliar, somebody training at the CrossFit games level, a true professional in that sense, what did a standard day when you were training for the games look like when you were hardcore at it? Yeah. I mean, and this is something that obviously over time evolved. So when I first got into it, you know, you're doing one workout a day, you're pushing yourself hard. And that was like the norm. Then as things evolved and I was fortunate enough to be a part of that kind of evolution, you had guys doing what they call double days and triple days or whatever. And so from 08 till like 9, 10, it wasn't a huge jump. Then from 10, the, there was a big deal that was signed with like Reebok. We, we went to the Home Depot Center, like the sport exploded. And so mm -hmm. with that came more people, more money and more kind of focus. And with that focus, it required you to train more because there was, there was a wider depth of things you're training for. You're training for swimming, you're training for long runs, you're training for heavy lifting. And because you had to expose yourself to all these different things, you had to spend a lot of time training in those modalities. It just takes time. So in the morning, it'd be like an hour of fasted cardio, you know, kind of long, slow distance training. Midday would be like a two hour traditional CrossFit block of like strength and conditioning, heavy lifting, Metcons, et cetera. And then in the evening, it would be stamina building. You know, and stamina building is really important because, you know, if you look at 10 general physical skills, so let's just say um, an individual is looking across like different modalities. So you have like stamina, strength, flexibility, accuracy, um, agility, balance, um, uh, cardiovascular. Uh, I, I've, I've named it a, a, a bunch, right? If you just do yoga, you'll get better at flexibility, balance, et cetera. If you just do weight training, you'll be really good at strength and maybe some power. Um, but you want to be balanced across all 10. So when you look at your training cycle, you want to hit long range, short range, different agility type things, but also stamina. So stamina would be like, if I asked you to do as many push-ups as you can, if you could perform one, you have the strength and you're not going to be out of breath. So it's not conditioning. It just becomes stamina. Like your muscle just can no longer fire. So I'd work that at night on things like handstand push-ups, pull-ups, et cetera. 
Yeah, the uh, too much analogy. of a lead training. Yeah, no, no, I love. I it. could go deep um, into it. Hey, there are a lot of financial advisors out there that are CrossFit junkies, or just like in like running Spartan races, you know, whatever their version of their pushing themselves physically is. Um, the I myself and a, my buddy Matt back in the day, um, we went to a level one cert. And uh, did you ever make it to? Gosh, it was in Kansas. It was on an army base. Where was it? Um, wonder if you ever did some of those I, those trainings. I didn't, do, I didn't do any in Kansas. I mean, I I, I did a I did a military base in New Mexico one time. That was just like gnarly. I did a military base in Japan and Okinawa, which was cool. Um, wow. But I, yeah, I traveled all over the country, all over the world, teaching seminars for CrossFit early on, like 2009, 2010. The the analogy they gave us in this level one certification was it was like if your fitness was like a bubble around you, like CrossFit's version is to make that as big as possible. Because to your point, if you've got a power lifter versus a marathon runner, they're very specialized in those two. This guy's obviously going to lift the world. This guy's going to be able to run for hours. But if you swap spots, they're going to fail miserably in the other right. role. And like. Uh, that was the thing like CrossFit will find your weakness, whatever it is, the way that that whole program works. So it was, it was cool to be a part of that. So I want to now go a little deeper on the CrossFit journey. Yeah. There was, I believe it was one of the CrossFit games. It might've been the year before you won where you were crushing it. And then there was a super long run mm. and your body, I think like basically gave out on you. And one of the things I remember you sharing with me, was it became almost like a mindset thing where you were training obviously hard and it was like the mindset is what started to get in the way of the success. And that's where, yes, we just heard the training you were doing physically, but there was this whole other aspect of mindset that you hadn't really trained and that unlocked, you're like, oh, I got to train there too. So would you share kind of how yeah. that came to be? You know, a, a really good way to think about it is you have mental fitness and you have physical fitness and when I started thinking about it through that as of late, um, it really, really hit home. Um, and you know, physically my fitness was on point, but my mental fitness wasn't even quite there. I didn't even necessarily know it at the time. So what you're referring to in 2008, I won the CrossFit games and I, I was the current champ going into 2009. And in 2009, I ended up taking fifth overall. However, the way I got there was very unique because the first event I was just over, like I was just too fired up. I, I was trying to listen to, you know, I don't even know what I was listening to in my headphones at the time, like Limp Biscuit and like rage even, against the machine. Yeah. Rage against the machine. <laughs> just, just thinking that I had to get fired up. And so at the time, the first event was a 10 K so like seven mile, uh, hill run. And it was pretty gnarly. Like there was parts that you were on, you know, your hands and your knees or hands and feet, kind of like bear crawling. I ended up getting poison oak from that, um, which was, that was a whole nother story. But anyways, so I, I come back around and I, I, I finished this like gnarly hill run. I have about a mile left at the time. I'd felt myself mentally, physically, just, just, just fatiguing in a way that I was just draining my system. I had, I had been too fired up for too long that I just, I just didn't have any more left in me. It was just, I, I was just, I was just empty. And I start running down this hill and I'm just like, I turn numb. And this is the first time this has happened to me. The following year, I ended up doing something similar, which I'll talk about. But I get to the bottom of this hill and I just pass out. I just black out and I end up falling on the floor. And I wake, I come to very quickly. It wasn't like I was like a life and death situation. I, co I come to very quickly. And the director of the cross games is named Dave Casher. He's like, hey, look, you know, if you don't finish this first event, your event, your CrossFit games are done. So I ended up, you know, getting back up, essentially finishing. I finished, uh, oddly enough, I beat three people. So I took 72nd <laughs> out of 75 on that. But from wow. a perspective, I was way back. So I finished that event. I, I take some time to like recharge. I figure out what was wrong. Maybe I was low on my blood sugar was too low. I was too anxious in my mind. But at that point, I had nothing to lose. I'd already, I'd already been at the top. I went all the way to the bottom. And now just my point to just be able to, and so I, what I learned from that was the mental side of how much that played in. So I ended up, you know, fighting my way back and ended up taking fifth. That following year, I go into the 2010 CrossFit Games with a first and a fifth underneath my belt. So I was the favorite to win because of those numbers. 
And a very similar thing happened because I had not developed the mindset yet of learning how to control my nerves. I thought I had to like fire myself up. I thought that I had to whatever. But the reality was being in front of a crowd with jets flying over and all this crazy stuff, it's going to fire me up anyways. And what I need to learn how to do is conserve energy, not, not, not allow it to expel. And I needed to learn how to focus on what was in my control, utilize positive self-talk, utilize breathing techniques to, to calm myself, not to be so elevated. And I ended up finding a mindset coach shortly after, and it changed my game. And I ended up having a great career following that. I mean, not that that was bad, but those were the moments that really started to reframe when I was looking at it. And turns out this mindset coach, which we can get into these other things, played a big role in real life as well. Let's do it. Um, where my where my head just went is everything you just talked about in uh, an athletic competition. I've seen many financial advisors out there. Their version of the CrossFit Games might be the live presentation with a room full of potential prospects. It might be the exactly. radio show, the TV show. It might be the actual appointment where you know there's a retiree with a million dollars sitting across from them, and that is game time for them. And I've seen people like kind of like freak themselves out. For and, sure. And not kind of be that calm version of their best self. So yeah, let's talk about yeah, let's, mindset. What what'd yeah, you hear from the coach? Yeah, I mean, and, and let's 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 talk about something very practical. I definitely want to get into the leadership stuff that I want to talk about for sure as we go on, but I just was um commentating on ESPN and this was like, I don't know, maybe a month ago for the CrossFit Games. Mm-hmm. And it was my first time live broadcasting on ESPN. So I've been on ESPN as an athlete, but never as a broadcaster. And it was very um, it was much more anxious than I anticipated. I guess this equates pretty well to the maybe more of what we're talking about, yep. where you, know, you got a couple people in your ear, you're prepping, you got multiple different cameras, and maybe for the people who are in the finance world, they have all this prep and they know that it's like on a high level. So like I knew live ESPN was like up here. I knew compete at the game was like up here. And when it's up there, you put a lot of stress on yourself. And so the 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 goal should be to First and foremost, even if you don't think you're stressed, you probably are stressed. And it's coming out in a variety of different ways in your life. And so you could take two circles you could put on a piece of paper. So let's just say a, a, one of your financial advisors has a biz, big meeting coming up. And we'll use that as an example. For me, it was sport. I go to this athlete and I, say, or I go to this mindset coach. And I say, hey, I'm really worried about that. And he asked me a very simple question. Take the thing that's stressing you out, this big meeting you have with this client, and take all the things that are in your control and put it in a circle on the left and all the things that are out of your control and put it on a circle on the right. Right. And for me, it was, Hey, take the things for competition that are stressing you out and take all the things for the competition and put them in the left, put them in the right. What's in your control, out of your control, take, take everything. And so what I ended up doing is I took this, um, this, this model and I started talking about things that were in my control. So for example, my, uh, tying my shoes, I'm going to triple tie them because if your shoes come untied in the middle of an event, that's like a very stupid reason to lose, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. Free game nutrition, completely in my control. I'm going to have my peanut butter, my honey. I'm going to make sure that I'm getting in my calories that I need. Free game music. What am I going to listen to? Uh, What is my mantra going into that event? What am I going to tell myself that's going to be the exact same? How am I going to warm up the exact same every time, regardless of the event that I'm performing? Um, and you list off all these different things that are in your control, right? There's, there's tons of them, right? Like, w- but now here are the things that are outside your control is what are my competitors going to do? What are the events going to be? What are, um, you know, uh, what is my judge going to do, right? These things were outside of my control, but they were oftentimes what I had focused on the most. And so when I went back to him and I showed him my two pages, he goes now, okay, now which ones do you normally focus on? And typically What I was doing was I was focusing on things that were outside my control, which made me feel like I had no control, which made me super anxious. And so once I started reframing that and focusing primarily, it's hard, but only on things that were in my control, it now made me feel empowered. It made me feel ready. It made me feel like I was earning the confidence to go out there and execute. And that was a game changer for me. That's such good advice. Um, there's a lot of stoicism in that advice right there. <laughs> of, you know? Yeah. I mean, not to get too deep, but the, the reality is, is that if you think about anything in life, that's really stressing you out, like real, real stuff. If you really look at it it's to its core, like 
you're only in control of what you're in control of. And I know it's an easy, like, you know, whatever, but if you really sit back and reflect, like, dude, I cannot control what my competitor is going to do. I cannot control what the judge is going to say. So what's in my control is moving well and preparing well so that the judge doesn't give me a no rep and that I kick mm-hmm. the other partner's ass or whatever, you know, it's the mm-hmm. same thing getting ready for a meeting. You know, if you're getting ready for a meeting, what's in your control to, to, to dress rehearse, to videotape yourself going through these things, to prepare, to show up early, to, to remove stress. So for example, if, you know, um, if you're going to have a meeting at 9 a.m. on a Tuesday, instead of maybe flying in that day, you fly in the day before. So this way you're not super anxious being at the airport. Those are things that you could do that are in your control to get your heart rate and your overall, like you sl- feel less flustered. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes, lack of preparation on your part does not constitute an emergency on mine. And what I see a lot is, you know, every entrepreneur, it's not just financial advisors, yeah. you're running so fast and so hard and getting pulled in so many different directions. Oftentimes what, what creates the stress is the lack of preparation. You didn't actually carve out the time to run through that live presentation you had to give in a room full of 60 people or to review the plan for the $2 million prospect that's coming in in 15 minutes. And so I love just going into the preparation aspect of that. Okay. So I have to ask you now, Sure. You said mantras was one of the things in yeah. your control. What were some of the self-talk and mantras you had going into? Was it different for every event? Was it different for every CrossFit games? Did you have like a theme? Like, how did you think through that? Well, I mean, the, the thing is you want it to be the same. So what you want to do is when you're in the garage, when you're at the gym, you're training, or in your case, if you're in the office and you're, you're, you're practicing, you want to have the exact same flow, whether you're in the office or you're, you're, you know, a uh, a thousand miles away getting ready for an event because you want your body to be triggered in the same way. So for example, if I'm at the CrossFit games, I will do the exact same warm up, the exact same way at my gym as I will at the CrossFit games. So now my body and mind are, are getting back into a groove where they're, they're mentally and physically preparing the exact same way instead of it being like it, same thing with nutrition. So for example, if I'm preparing every single day the same way at home, but all of a sudden I go to the games and I change. Well, that's weird. If, if I wasn't doing it before, I shouldn't be doing it now. So the mantra was always the same and, and it goes in this idea of earned confidence. So you talk about your financial advisors and you talk about preparation. Preparation allows you to earn your confidence. So what I would do is I'd wear a wristband almost daily and just said earned. Just like for your financial advisors, for example, they get in front of a $2 million, $10 million, billion dollar guy, right? No one gave them anything. They earned the right to get in front of that person because of who they are, because of the work they've put in, because of their reputation, because of their dedication. They earned it. And I think if you remind yourself that more often, it actually builds up your confidence because no one gave you anything. So for me, it was always about earning my confidence every single day in the gym. And today... It's about earning my confidence in jiu-jitsu, earning my confidence in business, earning my confidence through everything so that when I get in situations, I can fall back on that instead of this perceived concept, right? Like I could get in front of a group of financial advisors and maybe I start talking about 401k plans. I can maybe talk about it, but they're going to learn very quickly that I'm full of shit and that I'm, I don't have the earned confidence. I have not exposed myself yeah. to enough plans, but you can go out there and talk about it because you've earned the confidence. So my mantra was always move fast, breathe slow. Now this is very specific to CrossFit. So like, mm-hmm. don't use the one uh, financially. Um, but it was the idea that move with purpose, but keep your heart rate under control, right? So move mm-hmm. fast because you got to go. If you want to win, you got to go. There's no question. You got to breathe slow. You got to get your heart rate back down because as soon as your heart rate spikes, you're no longer in control. And so that was the mantra. So I'd be, I'd be on that starting block. They'd be about to be like, you know, ready, three, two, one, boom, buzzer goes off. It's like a deep breath, move fast, breathe slow. Let's go, Mike. Mm. My buddy was, you know, my, I'm money, baby. That's what he would tell himself. I, I love that one too. Who, who's money, that? One of my buddies, one of my training partners back in the day, he'd be like, right on that starting line, be like, I'm money, baby. I always love that one too. Love it. Uh, I know you had a chance to hang out with Chris Smith a little bit out in Tahoe, um, who does a lot of coaching uh, with us and has a really cool brand, the Campfire Effect. But one of my favorite things I've picked up from Chris 
he says, language creates. It speaks into existence. And if you look at humanity in general, everything that's been created came from some form of language, some shared idea, some shared, you know, cross with the shared community there. Some people call it a cult. I think it's, you know, a pretty beneficial cult to yeah, some. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the way that came to be was a shared belief system that all started with language. So I love it. You're, it's almost like you're, you're speaking it into existence is what you're doing. You're setting that mentality as you kick it off. That's right. Um, all right. So I want to go to one other thing as I was prepping for this. Um, actually the first time we met, you were pretty close. You had just kind of come out of this journey with your daughter, Ava, who mm. as a very young child, uh, she was diagnosed. Was she like five, four, yeah, like, like she was she, young. Yeah. She was four, about to be five. Yeah. Four years old. And, uh, it was blood cancer, correct? Uh -huh. Leukemia. Leukemia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I just, as a parent, three kiddos, we had the chance to do a little family workout. It was fun. Like my boys and my daughter were working out side by side with Dave out in Tahoe. And that was a fun little session. So thanks for putting that together. Um, but this girl's like going to do something really cool. Like she's got that drive. She's got a lot of, of her mom and dad in her and, um, wouldn't have even known it had I not known, you know, from reading the book and everything. And so we've talked about mindset and whether it's just in life in general, or whether it's business as an entrepreneur, it's only a matter of time before that first obstacle, that first like curveball. Um, that's just going to throw you way off track and the adversity. And I can only imagine as a parent who was also competing, running businesses at the time, that had to be an, an absolute body blow. So we're on mindset. Let's talk about mindset around adversity and how you tried to lead your family through that, support a daughter through that journey, who now, by the way, is five years cancer free. So love that. Um, but yeah, I just love to hear your thoughts on that because, man, that had to be just a tough season for you. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, very tough season. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, look, it's, 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 I'm grateful for the cross of games that I was able to develop these skills because those skills actually translated really well in real life. And I think it's one thing to talk about. It's another thing to actually practically go through it and see it come to life real time. You know, when you're, when you're training day in and day out in the garage and for anybody who's listening to this podcast, if you do not regularly exercise, you are missing out on the greatest gift you could ever give yourself. Like, I'm going to just say that one more time. If you're listening to this podcast, you're not walking. If you're not doing any form of physical fitness, you're truly missing out on the greatest gift you could possibly give yourself. Not only because of better health markers to look better naked, to, uh, you know, remove sedentary activities so you can get off the toilet, all those kind of things we already know, but also just in between the ears, you're doing something you don't necessarily want to do. So you're building up your confidence. You're exposing yourself to hard things and you're learning how to overcome them in a very constructive way. And I, I just think that it's the greatest gift because life will throw you curveballs. Everybody listening to this podcast has gone through some type of curveball. And the more you could callous or, or train your mind to overcome them, the better. So go out there and start walking, do something. Anyways, back to <laughs> the topic of him. Um, the gift of CrossFit gave me was this idea of positive self-talk, this idea of understanding what's in your control. And you could utilize that in situations even like with Ava. And we're very, very fortunate, you know, so it's two and a half years of treatment. And during that time, we spent a lot of time in the hospital, a lot of time in for a month, out for a week, in for a week, out for three months, in for a day, out for whatever. And it's just like, boom, 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 boom. A lot of things are outside your control. But I think if you could focus in on what's in your control, which is, you know, serving um, my daughter, how can I, how can I serve her? How can I make sure she's comfortable? How can I, how can I be her number one advocate, period? How can I educate myself so much on this disease that I'm going to be the expert? I'm going to, I'm going to educate myself. I'm going to know everything about what she's getting treated for and why she's getting treated for it. Those were in my control. And once I really started to dive into those things, it was really helpful. And obviously using positive self-talk when we saw beneficial things happen. Meanwhile, keeping relationships strong with my wife was critical during the time. So I think having those weekly date nights has been really important. I read the book, um, this is well, your recommendation, Family Boardroom. And at the end, he talks about this idea of like doing dates with your with your wife every you know couple months. My wife and I do it every week. And I think the advice he gave, which I found to be interesting, was come prepare with some type of question, which I thought was kind of cool. But anyway, mm -hmm. 
to your point, um, you know, when you face adversity, especially with your children, it's very difficult because you would trade places with them 10 times out of 10. Any, anybody would. And I, I think that those are the mindset tools you could develop now so that if or when life throws you a curveball, you're better prepared to handle it. Because I'll tell you, we saw a lot of, we saw a lot of tough things and the people who got through it better were able to try and keep a positive mindset through it. Yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine. And, um, but back to what was in your control and what wasn't like it worked when you were competing, you just applied that same lesson and mentality to life. Obviously, if you could take on that illness yourself, you wouldn't heartbeat, but you couldn't control that. So it's like, what can I control? I'm going to lean in there, keep the relationship between the spouse as strong as possible, support my daughter in every possible way I can through this really rough journey. And it just, it's interesting how those lessons can cross over and apply to different places. Yeah, they, 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 they do. And I, I just think that if you're not, they, they apply to work, they apply to life, they apply to everything. And, and, you know, we should be inspired at this point to embrace this, this concept of am wrapping. Like, so we talked about this last time, but it's like, if you could spend a lot of calculated time just developing great relationships, if you could spend calculated, strong, focused time developing your business and focused time developing your fitness, if or when life throws your curveball, you'll be best prepared to handle those things. And we're very fortunate that we had a network of people to support us. Um, and we had mindset tools that we had developed and my wife had developed because of our exposure to sport. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go to, I want to cross over to business. Um, yeah. I think people that know you well and follow you closely um, know this, but I, I, I remember just I, I, the first time we met, it was like, hey. I had a lot of respect for the guy I saw in the ESPN CrossFit games because I knew how hard the stuff you were doing was because I'd tried to do some of it in the gym. I'm like, that's next level training. There's a true level of dedication that he's done to get to where he's at. So I respected that about you and admired that about you. What I, what I came to find out about you is you actually are a really damn good business owner as well. Yeah. And um, the cool thing we were talking before we hit the record button here. And um, currently, you're running nine um, gyms, NC Fit, your brand, um, a lot of CrossFit style stuff going on there. And I, I know you've added your own spin on that as well. Um, and then we were talking about the app coming up, uh, Train Hard, I believe is the name of it. And then you also, as you examined your business, and I know you experienced COVID, which was not good for gym owners. Um, but you've you've really shifted and said, okay, yes, I want to be in the fitness space. But even that model has evolved a ton. So let's go to the business lessons and start to explore some of that. So I don't know if you yeah. want to start with COVID and the curveball that through, or wh where you want to dive into that at. Why don't we start from you know because I think a lot of people here probably are interested in business. In 2008, I opened our business. I opened our first gym. It was in a 1,500 square foot small retail location, or excuse me, small warehouse. And I signed a six month lease and I basically told myself, I'm either going to be successful enough that we expand out or we're going to close shop. So we ended up going from that location to a bigger location, to a bigger location, to a bigger location, but never opening a second location, just bigger. Right. Mm -hmm. And then shortly thereafter, like a year or two later, we ended up opening a second location and a third location and a fourth location. At that point, we're owning and operating these brick and mortar gyms and we signed a big corporate wellness account. Because we had done a lot of stuff with like local companies. We did some stuff with GoPro, a bunch of different people. We would just bring equipment and whatnot. Long story short, we ended up getting a corporate wellness account with um, Western Digital. And that took us globally um, starting in 2011. And so we opened up uh, 15 locations with them all over the world. Singapore, Thailand, China, Malaysia. So I traveled a lot. It was, it was, very, it was a very, looking back on it, it was a really cool time. It was obviously a lot of work because I was trying to compete professionally, open these locations and have a family. But that's what we did. So we had the brick and mortar. We had corporate wellness and that built up our business. And obviously I was competing. Then we started saying, hey, you know what? We need to have more streamlined approach at our gyms. We don't want to have one gym doing something, this gym do another. We need to streamline it. So we said, all right, well, let's create an app for our own coaches so that every day they go on there and they know exactly what to do. What's the session plan? How do you scale it? Daily video, all that kind of stuff. All digital resources so the coaches could have some guardrails on their, on their class. Well, turns out that that was something that other gym owners needed as well. So we ended up selling it to other gym owners through a digital space. That's our B2B model. So over the years and through COVID, obviously, it's a lot's changed. But where we're at today is that NC Fit 
owns and operates the brick and mortar locations in retail spaces now that are really nice. We um, provide uh, quarterly or or even more um, coaching development for coaches like curriculum. Like we do like webinars for them and we mm-hmm. serve gym owners through our app. So we have a B2B app that's very successful for gym owners. So we have a digital model and a brick and mortar model for the NC Fit side. What we realized though is that I'm interested in other things and our business has evolved. Like I'm not the same person I was when I opened the company and I was 21 years old. I'm older, my dad, I got two kids and my interests have changed. I'm no longer interested in just being the fittest on earth. I want to also be able to protect my family. I want to be able to develop skills. I want to expose myself to new things, including jujitsu and others. And so I wanted to try and provide that same I wanted to try and provide for dads who want to be better protectors, better providers, better, more fitness. I want to be able to provide them a resource. And I wasn't serving them well because NC Fit was so focused and is on gym owners and coaches and brick and mortar members. But what if you live in Kansas and you want to engage? You're like, dude, Jason's like crushing it. He's fit for his family. Like I want to do those type of workouts. We were not serving you well. And so moving in the near future, um, underneath the umbrella will be the train hard brand. And the Train Hard um, app by Jason Klepa will have three different types of programs on it. One to act the part, one to look the part, and one to never get to zero. And so it's three different workouts. It's based on what you're doing. So if you want to act the part, strength conditioning, let's go. If you want to look the part, it's a little bit more bodybuilding focus. And if you want to never get to zero, it's like an EMOM, 20, 30 minutes, you're done. And um, that's where we're going as a business. And sometimes it's tough. You know, you and I talked about this a little bit where sometimes I'll reflect and say, wow, it at our height, we had 150 employees in all these locations and whatnot. And, and, and sometimes I feel like, are we, are we not doing good now that our business has evolved and we have less employees, but the revenue is good. The profit margins are good. All, like everything subjectively is good, but it's just not what it was. And so all of a sudden I think like, are we dropping the ball? But I think that what I need to reflect on is like creating this vision of what success looks like for the future. And just staying committed to it. And that's where we're at right now. That's our, that's our journey, man. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing that. And you said a word in that last statement, vision. You were 21 when you started the company. You, I don't think we're a dad at that time. Right. No. Yeah. And so your vi- I mean, I look back to my 20 year old self. I'm like, wow, man, I was doing some stupid stuff back then. Uh, but I thought I was mature. Um, and so the vi- your as you've grown as a man and matured as a man, your vision has evolved and changed. And as an entrepreneur, one of the lessons I remember as I was leaving a really good gig in a prior life to, to venture out with Sean, my business partner, and start Triad, we're right at about three years in now. Scary. Um, leap of faith. Um, you know, second guessing yourself. But what I was sure is, hey, there's something different that I think we can build that deserves to exist in the world of finance. And I, you've experienced some of that with Do Business, Do Life and the mission that we're on. But I remember reading a note and it was from a founder and he said, one of the things that can happen with founders if you're not careful is you will leave you know, what feels like a prison because you're not able to build things on your terms. And then you'll go starting building And then you'll look up a few years later and you'll realize you actually built your own prison cell around yourself by your own doing Mm. accidentally. And where my head went, Jason, is like I'm picturing 2011. You're flying all over the world, opening up gyms. You're competing. You're also now a family man. And my guess is there was probably some red line like there's not enough Jason to go around. There's not enough hours in the day to like deal with all of this stuff I'm trying to do all at once. Was that part of what led to the evolution of like, wait, I need this business to serve me and where I'm at now versus, you know, go like open a gym on every street corner, which might have been the idea when you were 21. What's how did that journey play out? No, I I think that's a really good question. I mean, I also think like recognizing as a business that like, you know, something I've had to reflect on, too, is like, is it is it contributing 20 percent to our bottom line revenue or top line revenue and 80 percent to my to my stress, right? It, mm. If it is, you have a, as an owner, you got to evaluate, you know, what, what is the vision and, and, and what does success look like for me? Um, I want to be able to go to my kids games. I want to show up everywhere. 
You know, one of my mentors told me one time, and I, I just this just stuck with me. He's like, you know what success is for me? I was like, what's that? Because his house was was moderate, moderate, but he'd wear a hundred thousand dollars in watches every day, right? But his house was moderate, and I knew he did very well for himself. He's like, success for me one day is I want to go to every single college, high school, football game, volleyball game that my children play. In. Every single one, anywhere in the country. So he, his son ended up playing in college. And he went to every single game. So he wanted to have the financial means and the and the freedom to travel to go watch his kids. And it, it always stuck with me because he hit two birds with that. He didn't just say, I want to have the money to be able to fly somewhere, right? Or whatever. He also wanted to have the freedom to take Friday off if he needed to, to go do those things. And that's kind of where I'm at in my life. And that's where it's evolved is that we've had to be more strategic. Do I want to have a team of, 150 people that are doing okay or would I rather And the vision early on was like, let's create as much revenue as we can and provide financial freedom to as many people as we can. That was always the goal. Like I want to impact as many people as we can. I want as many employees as we can. But what I came to learn is that what I'd rather have is less employees who are all eating filet mignon and doing really, really, really well than have more employees that are doing okay. I want our people to thrive. And one way that we could thrive is by taking what we've learned and expanding it digitally instead of just focusing on the brick and mortar. Yeah. That's, um, you queued up a quote in my head. We had uh, Tim Tebow. Have you ever trained with Tim Tebow? I feel like you I guys haven't. should have crossed, crossed paths by now. But um, he, Tim has been a really, uh, we've had him come out to a couple of triad experiences and just one of the favorite who he is publicly is who he is in real life. The chillest, most down to earth dude. And um, yeah, just a great human. And um, he said something at one of our first experiences and he was sharing a story about one of his high school coaches, the difference between success and significance. Success is me focused. I focused significance is pouring into others and what you leave in others. And that's what I hear that you just shared. You're like, let's like kind of bring this pack down and let's massively overserve and pour into them instead of just kind of be like mediocre for a lot of people. It's actually very similar to triads model. Like you, yeah, you saw it it's like, let's not work with everybody. Let's just work with the people that align with like top performers, growth minded people we want to do business, do life with, and let's go all in on that and not work with the masses. And it's fun to be in those sort of communities. It, it, um, it, it so I, I align a lot with that. And, and, and kind of diving deeper instead of wider, like that's one of the reasons why like NC fit has done really well for gym owners, for coaches, for brick and mortar, but it's not, it can't be everything to everybody and that's okay. Um, but if my interest is to help dads in particular level up, like I want to help them never have fitness inhibit what they need or want to do. Like, I want to be able to provide them resources and tools if they're looking for it to be able to keep up their kids every day. When my son comes home from school every day, dad, let's go play baseball. Dad, let's go play. Da, 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 da. Mm. You know how it is, right? Mm. And do you really want to be that guy who says no? Like you only get so many no's because you're tired before they stop asking. And I want to be able to help dads be able to do that. Like tomorrow morning, I'm doing a men's club ruck 7am. We're putting backpacks on, we're rucking. And that really calls to me because I feel like I have a set of skills I've developed over the years and I want to be able to share it with dads because it's not that complicated. He's got to know how to do it and you got to be inspired. So anyways, that's where we're going. And I guess the scary part is if I'm being like vulnerable about it, is that the scary part is it's just not what we've done. And mm -hmm. I think that that's okay. You know, like it's okay to like, listen, if it keeps coming back to you, like it keeps like pulling at you, like it's okay to do new things, you know? And, and, you shouldn't be the same person, the same company you were 10 years ago. Otherwise, you're just going to get left behind. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I shared this in my very first episode because a lot of people, I think, when they saw me leave my prior gig, they're like, is this dude crazy? Because, I mean, I had a really good, and I was making more money. That as a, a small-town farm kid, I remember thinking, like, if I can make $100,000 a year someday, I'm, I'm set. And how it all played out, like, I just remember pinching myself. I'm like, wow, how did this even come to be? But the truth is the sacrifices I was making 
the time away from the kids, the family dinners missed, the ball games missed. I'm like, there is no amount of money that can buy that time back with my children. And Bron- my wife and I were just talking, our oldest is 13 now, seventh yep. grader. It's going to go like that, and he's going to be out of high school. No thanks. I don't want that trade-off. Even if it's five times the amount of money in a bank account, that time is priceless. I will never be able to buy that back. And I, that's, we have a very shared common belief there. And I think that's one of the reasons, like the more I get to know you, the more I connect on a deeper level, because there are people that are willing to make that sacrifice and that's okay. I'm not judging them. Um, that's just not me. And that's not the people I want to surround myself with, you know? And, yeah. um, it's fun when you get really intentional in life. Yeah. And I think that we're getting more and more intentional every day. And I think that it just takes a lot of awareness and, um, kind of like self-reflection on like, what, what are we trying to do? What is success? What does this look like? And, and again, just to reiterate, like, and being okay with the fact that things change over time. I think that that's where maybe I've struggled the most is that like, you know, some people live in like their, their glory days. Um, for me, like, dude, the CrossFit games were phenomenal for me, but they weren't my glory days. Like my glory days are now like, dude, I'm getting to watch my kids throw down. Like I'm 30, I turned 38 in two weeks. And I feel like I'm just getting started. Like truly I do. I feel like I'm just getting started because I'm old enough to kind of have this perspective and, and growth mindset, but I'm young enough to still be hungry and, and want to do better in all areas of my life. And so it's like, it's a good time, man. I, I hope everybody listening yeah. is like in their late thirties, forties, even early fifties feels that same way. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what I witnessed in Tahoe. Um, And I'm sure you've experienced this with as much as you've been involved in sports in your life. Some of the best players do not always make the best coaches, right? That's sometimes a different skill set that does not translate. For sure. And one of the things that I've seen in you, you're an incredible coach. Um, It's a testament to why you've been able to build what you've been able to build so far. Um, But now the evolution that I saw is you're not just training adults, guys like me, that next generation of kids and, and infusing this, like just training as part of a lifestyle, not like, yep. not like work. But it's like, no, this is just how you should be. And I know like my kids, I'm like, yeah, let's get in as many of those rooms as possible because I don't want them to just hear it from dad. I want them to hear it from guys like you. And that's, what's kind of cool. The next evolution for you is what's that next generation. And you know, someday maybe it's your kid's kids. Because I know yeah. you're going to keep getting after it, and you're probably going to be the fittest, like seventy year old that you're you not, can that's be. That's the goal. You know? That's the goal. I mean, like the way that I look at sports is like sports and training is just it's just got to happen. It has to happen because it teaches you so many life skills you're going to use for the rest of your life. And the way I look at self defense is kind of like brushing your teeth. Like you don't really necessarily want to always do it, but you need to do it. Is the, that's the way I look at self defense for the kids. But when it yeah. comes to sports and training. It should just be a part of your life because you're going to get so much more from it than what you're putting into it. It's, it's, it's going to be night and day for you. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm all about it. I know, especially the sports and group sports. So you just queued a conversation we had out in Uh-oh. Tahoe. Um, I hope you're cool with sharing this. I think you dude, will be. Dude, I like uh, so you, yeah. so you, uh, you mentioned, so is, your, is Ava 12 or 13 now? 12. 12. And you mentioned a conversation you had with her about her wanting to go out with her friends. Oh yeah. And you said, well, yeah, I would love for you to, and here are kind of the requirements to be able to do that. Will you share that story? Cause I thought that was such a cool story. Yeah. So, you know, my daughter's 12. Um, she's a, you know, a petite, uh, girl and, and just like many, many are. And I told her she was probably like, I mean, she, she was probably like eight at the time. And I was like, Hey, look, you want to go out one day, right? She's like, yeah, of course. I'm like, you want to go with your friends to the mall? You want to go to the movies? You want to go do something? I'm like, yeah. I was like, I'll give you, I'll, I'll, I'll make you a deal. I was like, you could go out with your friends as soon as I feel comfortable with your self-defense skills. That's typically like, let's just call it like a blue belt in jujitsu or, or a specific, like, let's just say there's a benchmark. I said, you could, you could choose to start now with me or you could wait until you're older and then start. Either way, it's your decision. But the longer you wait, the longer it's going to take you to acquire the skills that are going to make me feel comfortable. So what would you like to do? And she's like, let's start tomorrow. I'm like, all right, let's go. (laughs) So that's the way it kind of, that's the way it it, it created itself. And uh, it's been good. It's been fun. Hey, I think you can sell a little bit too, based on that. It's like, hey, I'll just give you the option. What would you prefer? 
Um, but I, but that's what I love is like, there's a lesson there in parenting instead of, and by the way, I've been very guilty of like the trying to force kids into like what you need them to do. You offered a choice. Like this is your choice. And with the, when the thing with self-defense and the kids understand this now, they're a little bit older, nine and 12 is like with my son. And, and I, I try not to be overbearing about it. Right. But I just express them like, look, this world is a tough place. And and it is my job to try and prepare you as well as I can for that. And the way I prepare my son is different than the way I, I prepare my daughter. They, they have two different threats coming to them, like like your son, for example, and compared to my daughter. They're, they're, they're the same age, similar age. They're completely different. Your son is, it, it, you don't have to worry. What I worry about with my son is I never want him to be the bully. So I need to train and develop his self-confidence that he is never the bully and he always stands up for others. Whereas Ava, I don't need her. I'm not worried about her bullying somebody. I'm worried about somebody putting their hands on her. And so I train them very differently. And that's just the reality of life. You know, she's a hundred pounds and she's probably not going to get too, too much bigger. I don't, I don't know, wherever she's X height, my son, like he's still growing. He's going to be 200 plus pounds. Like it's just a night and day difference. And that's why we train them a little bit differently. I'll tell you the common theme though, that I'm picking up confidence. Yeah, because actually bullies bully because of lack of confidence from my hundred percent, hundred percent. So what are things let's talk, let's go to like dad mode for this is the do business, do life podcast. That's what I love about it. Yeah. We can go wherever we need to go here. Um, when it comes to instilling confidence in kids, I heard the Ava story. What, what other thought processes do you have? Well, I think you bring up a really good point. Just to summarize, like with Caden the biggest bullies I ever saw in my life were always the ones that were most insecure. That always happened. And so if I could develop his confidence by training, he will never feel obligated to be a bully. If I could develop his confidence through sport, through, through hard work, through all these different things that develop his confidence, he will have the comfort to be nice and low key. And that's what we want. We want that, that, that controlled confidence and comfort, right? Where he's not, he doesn't have to boast. He doesn't need to be that guy. He doesn't ever, ever going to bully somebody. And he also needs to be loving and caring and all the things that we care about in a man. Whereas with Ava, that confidence comes through aggression. It's a little bit different. Her confidence, I grip, I grab her wrists. I want you to boom. Her confidence comes from training over and over me, grabbing her by the waist, me putting her over my shoulder, me doing all kinds of stuff to her. So she could develop that confidence that if someone did put their hands on her, she could act immediately and act with violence. And that's what I believe she needs in that, in that particular situation. But um, sorry, I, I can go off these, these tangents because I'm just very passionate about it. I, I just want to really, as a dad, I want to look back and be like, did I do everything in my power to set my kids up for success? Did I provide them all the tools that I wish I had had when I was younger to live a lifestyle that was one where I was loving and caring and compassionate and giving, but also hardworking and, and had the grit to survive in a world that's going to be tough, you know? Yeah. Well, I think this is a perfect transition. We were talking right before we hit record. So CrossFit Games champion, three times on the podium, three times Team USA, seven years in jiu-jitsu, uh, purple belt currently, soon to be brown belt, hopefully, right? And then you said, hey, I got this next thing up. Oh, yeah. Um, I believe it's called the tactical game, So, which goes back to like the self-defense. So let's, what's next on Jason's radar when it comes to just pushing yourself to the next level? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think physically I want to continue to, to learn new skills. I want to unlock pathways between my brain and my body through a bunch of different factors. And so yesterday I was using a laser gun. So if, so if anybody's anti-firearms, there is laser components that could work similar accuracy components. So in my life, I've done a lot of fitness. Not much of it works accuracy. Accuracy is a tough thing to work unless you're utilizing a bow, a gun, et cetera. Yeah. You do wall balls, but that's like throwing a ball at like a wall. It's pretty easy. Mm -hmm. to, um, and so for me, I was introduced a while ago. I've been training with local law enforcement for years, um, monthly. Uh, I've been training and training and training just monthly. My son and I will go and we will work with the department and we will get trained on firearms. And I'm a big believer that if you're going to own a firearm, you need to be able to be properly trained on it. And turns out um, there's something called the tactical games, which basically blends CrossFit with, um, with shooting sports. You do an event, you, you know, put 10 rounds on a target. You do an event, you put 10 rounds on a target mm. scored. 
It just seems like something I'd, I'd really want to test. I've never tested myself high, you know, on, on an accuracy component. I did it one time at an event long ago. That was like a biathlon. But I just remember thinking to myself, like, that was really hard back then to get your heart rate elevated and then shoot a target. You got to learn how to control your breath. You have to learn how to, you know, all these fine motor skills while you're fatigued. So that's mm -hmm. my next, that's my next focus, tactical games. I just have a feeling you'll do okay. <laughs> I, I, I know how you approach things. So, uh, so, so is this, is this like kind of CrossFit games level where there's like, it's televised or, or what's the, I've never heard of it. So I'm curious. Yeah, no, I, I think, I think it's a little bit more old school than that, but it's, it's growing. It's growing from people who are interested in CrossFit who want to also test their skills. So it's, it's more, a little bit more grassroots, but I mean, they have, you know, uh, I don't know, 500 people show up to each competition, 500, a thousand. Um, and there's a lot of safety mechanisms put in obviously. Uh, and, and there's, you know, like maybe like 12 events throughout the year and then there's national championships. And so it's, it's something newer for me, but I'm excited to dive deep and, and, and to share. And if nothing else, just look back and be like, Hey, what's my 2023, 2024 goals right now for the rest of this year, I want to compete at, um, Nogi worlds, which is in December for jujitsu. And then in 2024, I want to create like three goals, so like tactical games, maybe some type of jujitsu tournament, something, um, maybe even an Ironman, just something to say that I'm going to be the guy who's always trying to push myself and, and, and train hard, especially if we have other people who are being inspired by that. Like, dude, that fires me up. I, I want to keep moving. Where do you think that comes from, man? Um, I'm just, I'm sitting here listening. You're an incredibly driven human. We talked about kids. Yeah. Going back in your journey, like, are there mile markers where you're like, this probably had some impact of like what that drive and that mo there's a lot of very successful people that are scared to get uncomfortable. Um, there's a history in your story of like, Oh, kind of did okay. in the CrossFit games on to the next thing. I, you know, this is a new challenge. Where's that come from, man? I, I don't know. I, you know, I think it's just an internal struggle with myself to, um, to want to level up. And in particular, I mean, the, the highest level of this is being a dad, the highest level, like, mm -hmm. like I need to continue to talk to guys like you to, to read, to explore, to, to keep doing so that when I look back on the journey as a dad, like you want to always say, you know, you look at your dad, my dad's amazing. And you say, okay, what, what, what can I take and, and say, those were amazing characteristics and how do I improve on them? And then I hope my son takes what he's loved about what I've done and improved on those. And the goal is that every generation just levels up on the previous one before it. And I'd say that, you know, I think from a work ethic perspective, sometimes I don't really know if I equate this directly, but my, my background, you know, my dad came from Iran when he was 18, 19, his, um, mom and dad ended up coming here during the revolution. They came here when they were like in their early sixties and they started from scratch. Um, okay. they went from being super rich in Iran to, uh, opening up a dry cleaning business and they were hustles. And maybe as a kid, I would be there. Maybe this imparted on me. I, I don't know. Maybe it did. It probably did. Where you'd go there and hear these people in their sixties, just getting after it in one of the grimiest businesses, dry cleaning, especially back then it was just nasty. And they would okay. just work hard, no excuses. And, um, maybe that inspired me, you know, and then obviously my mom's mm. family, same thing, like just hardworking people surrounded us, you know, and I think maybe that had a lot to do with it. Mm. That's cool. I'm glad we went there. Uh, I grew up on a farm in Kansas throwing hay bales in the summer, fixing barbed wire fence. And, uh, this is, this is something I struggle with. My kids are growing up in a vastly different environment than I did financially, experientially. Like I didn't ride on an airplane until I think I was a junior or senior in high school the first Dude, time. Same, like, same here. That's so funny. Yeah. My kids like had a passport. You could, you, we could have been smuggling kids out of the country because it was like a five month old. And I'm like, how do you even. <laughs> that's so, so funny. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. So there was a conversation, actually, a guy named Taylor that's going to be coming up on the podcast, and we were just talking about kids, and this subject came up, and he was in a therapy session, and he said um, he was really, like, worried um, for his kids, just, like, spoiling them and right. having them take things for granted and all of that, 
and he somehow his wife came up and they were talking about um, she didn't come from much and how she'd like kind of worked her way into her own success. And the therapist said, well, your wife did okay without coming from much, you know? And I sometimes struggle with that because as a dad, never went to Chuck E. Cheese once, ever, as a kid. And I remember I would see the commercials and I'm just like, someday. And I probably took each of my kids to Chuck E. Cheese monthly for like as long as they wanted to go, right? And so it's this kind of balance you try to play of give them some of the fun stuff you never had, but at the same time, you don't want them to be spoiled and take it for granted and turn into those kids we all like don't like to be around, you know? So sure. what, what are your thoughts just going back and like what you learned as a kid, obviously that treated you pretty well, work ethic. And now as you go into raising kids of your own, like what's your balance there? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question. So I did not grow up poor. So I just want to make sure, like I did not grow up poor, but we did not grow up rich. So we did not travel. We did not go anywhere. We stayed home. Um, we maybe went out to eat like once a month, maybe, maybe. Um, and that's even then it's like fresh choice type type stuff. Like, but we were, we always had what we needed. We always had what we needed. We always had food on, you know, food there and clothes on our back. So I'm not, I'm not saying that, but we were not, it was not abundance mindset, right? Mm -hmm. My, my wife very much so different. Um, her dad was very, very successful, um, when she was young and she's, she's traveled all over. Like she, she's, she's been given a lot. Right. Mm -hmm. But she's amazing. She doesn't take things for granted. She's hardworking. She's, and we both come from very different backgrounds, but although we met in high school, so we, we obviously we connected there, but I've seen a lot of people in my high school. Cause I went to a private Catholic high school because my parents did prioritize education for in, in their sense, prioritizing education meant to go to a private Catholic school. Mm -hmm. And I met a lot of people there, some with a lot of money, some with not as much money, everybody, you know, no one was like super poor, but some people were super rich and some people were kind of, you know, doing okay. And what I learned through that experience was that the way the parents parented, regardless of how much money people had, if you parented the appropriate way by teaching them the value of a dollar, by teaching them that this is special to be able to go do these things. Do not, do not assume that everybody does this. This is special. Um, this is a treat. Like, I think it's the way that you come off. I think for our kids, they have definitely have privilege. They've traveled, they've done a lot of different things, but we always try and have them keep that in perspective. That it's always please. It's thank you. It's being grateful. It's being very, very blessed. Like we're very grateful. And I think if you have that mindset that nothing is given, this has been earned and you guys are doing great and we're going to give you this, but you're not going to get everything. If we're going to go to the store, you're going to get one thing. I think those little micro things over time build character where when someone goes to Tahoe, like for your experience, my children were over the moon. Have they been to Tahoe? Have they done something similar? Sure, but never that way. And, and even if they had done it that way, they're just grateful to be there. Whereas mm -hmm. it's not like it's a, I guess the difference would be as, as parents, if we had been like, um, oh, this is fine. It says like, wow, could you imagine how amazing this is? This is beautiful. We get to do this. Then the kids realize like this is something special and they keep it at a high level their entire life instead of it just being the norm, I guess is a way to put yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Love that, man. And I love surrounding myself with people that can go deep on topics like this that matter. Um, so well, like yeah, something any... I think about a lot, like here's, here's something, yeah. not, I'm sorry to cut you off, but it's like, no, I think good. about this like for my daughter or, or for my son. How do I set them up for long-term success? Yes, with their fitness and so, but like finding a significant other, right? And finding joy and happiness in their life. If, if we condition them today, that it's all rainbows and unicorns, you're going to get anything you want, you're going to do anything you want, you're going to, like, we're going to go to Cabo every week, you're going to stay at the Four Seasons. Like, if we condition them too much, the expectation of what success is or the expectation of what brings you joy becomes an un, unfulfilled, like it, it, your ability to get there will be very slim. And so what we need to do is be aware of that, of what are we conditioning our children to think is, is going to bring them joy. And if we use things that are materialistic, like trips and whatever, it, it will never be enough because they're always going to want to seek more. 
But if we find ways to show them joy through other things, and these other events are just things that occur in your life, that's where I think success comes from. Yeah. Yeah. If, if there's ever a point where going to the Ritz Carlton or the Four Seasons becomes the norm and my, but like, start with me. If I ever take that for granted, that's exactly. where it starts. And I love your point of like, this is going to be amazing. Not, you know, we're so fortunate. We're so blessed because a lot of families never get this their entire life. Exactly. It starts there. Um, I heard once, and I, I believe this to my core, that the greatest gift you can give your children is to love their mother. And that's kind of what, what you said there a little bit. You're like, how do we model it? And then all of that cascades down. It's actually very similar to business. What do you model in leadership? And then how does that cascade to the team? There's a lot of crossovers in being a good parent and being a good leader at the office, okay. in my opinion. Um, I know we're getting close uh, to wrapping up here, but on leadership in general, because you show up like a leader in the room, you show up with the presence, whether you're leading a workout, whether you're leading your business, I'm sure, or at home. What are some thoughts around just leadership in general, mindset around that? Any any parting thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you asked that. I know we had talked about this earlier. I just, I, I, I feel deeply connected to this right now. And I just want to make sure I mention it. This idea of detachment, it's been really, really, really powerful for me. And so I hope that anybody listening can take something away from this. I was recently at Echelon Front Leadership Summit. I don't know if you've ever heard of Echelon Front's Jocko's company. And it was an FTX course. What they do is they give you these laser guns and you go out and there's like 50 guys and there was a couple of girls, 50 guys, 50 people. And you're wearing these laser, whatever. And you're trying to like go take down a target. And what you do is you take down a target. And as you're trying to, whatever, there's other guys out there that are throwing smoke bombs, playing loud music. They're trying to create disruption. So the 50 of you have different roles as leaders. Some of you guys might be the head. Some of you guys might be in charge of a smaller group. Some of you guys might not be anything. You might just be an individual contributor. And you need to go out there and go perform the task. And what they're looking for is as you lead or don't lead is what comes out naturally when you're high stressed. So this FTX course was really powerful because you get guys who are trying to make decisions who are in the lead role while smoke grenades and whatever are going off. And they start freaking out and you see their natural tendencies as a leader that might come up more in business. So it's, it's not a tactical course. You're not learning how to mm. take, you know, they're trying to see what leadership principles are you not incorporating? Well, anyways, one of the leadership principles that I found the most impactful was this idea of detachment and detachment from your ego, your emotion and your perspective. So I just want to share, um, the way I, I think about that. So someone comes in uh, late for a meeting, let's just say for you guys, um, for us, maybe it's late for a class and immediately when someone walks in the room, your ego gets caught off guard because you are saying, why is this person late for a meeting? All of a sudden it's attacking my ego. Am I not important enough that, that you would show up on time? For example, right? That's, that's your ego getting in the way and you could, and it comes off the energy initially comes off. Then you get emotional. Maybe you react by saying, Oh, thanks, Brad. You know, five minutes late, right? That's an emotional reaction. You never, you never make a good reaction when you're emotional about something. And then finally, you're looking at through your perspective. Your perspective is Brad's late for a meeting. He's disrespecting me. He's cutting into my time, but maybe Brad's perspective is totally different. You have no idea what he has going on in that day. And so the lesson here, and I'll use my analogy, the CrossFit Games one year, we were competing and we were in like some final events. And one of our team members tore her AC on an event. And at the time, I didn't detach. I act emotionally. I act with my ego in the way. And I did not look at it through any other perspective other than my own. And so when I, when I look back on that, that situation 10 years down the line, what I needed to do was take a step back, take a deep breath and just detach from those different things. Am I walking into this meeting? Am I walking into these situations with my ego, my emotion and my perspective detached? Because I just, I, I find that we all come to it from a different perspective. So imagine this person who comes in late for your meeting. What if they had found a woman on the side of the road who 
their tire was popped and they need to help them replace the tire. So this is a true story I'll, I'll share with you. One of the guys, his name is JP. He's a Navy SEAL, former Navy SEAL. He shows up five minutes late, 10 minutes late for a jiu-jitsu class or a CrossFit class. Shows up late. The instructor says, hey, frog man, go ahead and start doing some, uh, some burpees in the corner. We know that you guys are always on time, but not today. And his response, roger that, and starts doing burpees. He never goes back to that CrossFit gym again. The reason why is that that instructor did not take the time to detach from his ego, his emotion, or look at it through any other person's perspective. What had ended up happening, it's a true story. On the way to the gym, JP had found a woman with a flat tire and helped her change it and then get back on the road. If all that instructor did, had walked over, be like, hey, JP, what's up, man? Like, you're never late. Like, what's going on? And JP had said, hey, I was helping in this situation. All of a sudden, what would have happened? It would have just deflated the situation. No more would the ego, the emotion, or the perspective get in the way. But everybody comes to it with their own lens. And I think what we need to do is do a better job of looking at through somebody else's. And uh, that's what I'm focused on as a leader, is how can I show up on every Zoom call, take a deep breath before I get on and say, hey, what am I checking today? I'm going to make sure that I'm looking at it through Brad's perspective. He is not the owner. He doesn't know what's going on on these facets of the business. So when he asks a question, when he says something, I need to remind myself that Am I communicating effectively? Because he doesn't have the same backstory. The perspective is different. And sure as hell, I should not be making any decisions if I'm emotional. Love that. And, and the tough part about being a human is we all have emotions. And uh, one of my favorite quotes, between stimulus and response, there is a space if you allow there to be one, right? And that's where your freedom and your growth comes from. And I'm butchering the last half of that. But where I've reacted at my worst is when it was like a crack on a sidewalk right and where i do my best work is when you sit back detach right give yourself space and then show up how you want to show up and that works in business and parenting and being a husband and it's it's even the best at that and and i'm trust me like i've known that for the last 10 years and i still struggle some days with that yeah, and uh, you just got to keep putting in the reps on that one yeah, it's, it's, it's deeply what I'm focused on because it, it'll earn more leadership capital with your team, right? You, you take leadership capital away when you act reactively and a way to not be reactive is to detach. You know, our, our, mm -hmm. our emails, our internet, our website all shut down a couple months ago. And when I got on the Zoom call, I was emotional. My ego really mm -hmm. wasn't in check, but my, I was emotional and mm -hmm. I acted, I acted as such. And all of a sudden, all that leadership capital, I worked so hard with my team to build up where they look at me as this guy who's really trying to lead from the front to do the right thing. Just, I just knocked it down 10%. It's like, damn it. I worked so hard to build that up. But anytime you act irrationally, you take away leadership capital from your team. Yeah. All right, my man. I know we're right at time. Here's my last question for you. You know, Let's this is do the it. Do Business, Do Life podcast. Do Business, Do Life. You experience Do Business, Do Life in person. So I would love to hear Jason Kalipa's definition of what do business, do life means to you. Dude, do business, do life to me means exactly what you put on, which is combining what you do for a living with what you do for what you do to make money with what you do for a living, meaning together. So it's, it's doing business and it's doing life together. It's not this idea of like work life balance. It's finding a way to combine the two as one beautiful synergy to lead a success for your overall family. And that's exactly what you're doing. And that's what I'm trying to do too. With in bringing my kids along this journey with me, that's doing business and doing life and exposing them to all the things that I wish I was exposed to as a kid. Well, I'll tell you what, one of my proudest moments, by the way, I don't think I shared this with you. Um, by the way, I love that definition. Um, you had to fly out a little early because you were going to commentate for the CrossFit games. And you're like, dude, my wife and kids don't want to leave. And I was like, good. We did this right then. We created an experience for you guys too. Because one of the things I've just seen over the years is there's a lot of really cool events in our industry, a lot of cool keynote speakers that get up on stage and do their thing. I was like, no, thanks. Let's bring who we bring into the community and just let them experience it along with everybody, everybody and create access. And I want it to be as fun for you as I hope that it's fun for our community. So it sounds like we at least got Dude, some of that right. You nailed it. We're in the red home. It's like, when are we doing it again? I'm like, I don't know, man. I don't know. And it, like almost every other week, they're like, hey, so what's uh, what, when's the next uh, 
DBDL uh, event. I'm like, well, I don't know. Let me talk to Brad. I was like, well, just take a, take a moment. I love it. And so you're I doing it right. It. You know, I think if you're a financial investor out there uh, and you haven't had much exposure to these guys, you're not just walking the, or you're not just talking the talk. You're walking the walk when it comes to that. I think that's really important. So thanks for everything you've been doing too. Well, thanks, Jason. I, I you you'll, if you want to be back to one of our experiences, you'll be back. There's an open invite. So we'll talk about that when we've got more time, but thanks for, uh, thanks for the conversation. Thanks for carving out the time. I always get better every time we connect and ha have these conversations. So until next time, hopefully in person. Let's do it. All right.